Amen. If you're, uh, if you're not a big fan of kids and of teenagers like I am, this is probably going to be a little bit of a long Sunday for you. You're probably going to be a little bit annoyed this Sunday because I love kids, I love teenagers, and that's t- this, this week we're getting in the game with the younger generation. Amen? Can we do that? Can we get in the, ge- the game with this generation? Uh, man, I'll tell you what, I am so happy, I'm so blessed, whatever word you want to use to be to be at this church. This, uh, earlier this month marked exactly a year when Pastor Rob graciously decided to bring us on staff in this church, welcomed us, welcomed me back into your arms uh, as a staff member here. And man, I tell you what, we, we still wake up sometimes and just pinch ourselves and say, like, seriously, God? Like, we're the youth pastors at Trinity. Like, we're so, uh, we're so thankful for that. So thank you to this church for, again, just allowing us to minister to this amazing group of teenagers right here. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Uh, if, you see, if you see something from this section this morning getting thrown up here at me, it's probably from the green team or the blue team. I'm wearing orange colors today. I'm kind of wearing, uh, yeah, I'm wearing e- enemy colors, and there's an explanation for that. I'm a chubby guy. Chubby guys sweat. I'm under these lights. I'm wearing, I'm going to sweat this morning, and as I kind of weighed the options for the colors this morning, I kind of thought orange might gross you out the least as I begin to sweat through my shirt this morning. So I promise you, teenagers, I love all colors equally. I love all momentum teams equally, but uh, Side note to that, orange has been completely dominating the competition. So there is something to be said about just wearing, you know, wearing winning colors this morning. So part of that. Is it okay if I just brag a little bit about the teenagers here? I'm going to do it anyway. So everybody just nod your head. I tell you what, we give God such an amazing group uh, of youth here. Amazing group of teenagers. I'm so excited about what's happening in youth ministry. I'm so excited about how God is moving in youth ministry. I just want to tell you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, this week, we're the, we're the third weekend to a four-week outreach called Momentum, which I'm sure you've all heard about. If, uh, if, if you come on Wednesday nights and you come in the West Lobby, you've probably came into more madness, probably than you ever walked into in this church. We've had music blasting down there, and everything's been hyped up. And Basically, the students are bringing their friends. It, it, it's an outreach event. Students are getting saved. Students are, are, are making the decision to follow Christ. I, I believe somewhere around 20 students so far in the first two weeks, for the first time, have said, man, I want to follow Christ. It may have, e- it may have even been more. I, I try to keep track of stuff like that, and I end up getting so excited and caught up in the moment that I kind of forget to count hands and count numbers. But I'm pretty sure Jesus is still up there with, with a book, you know, writing those names down. So I'm going to let him keep track of that, and I'm just going to get excited and get behind him because it's so exciting what he's going, what, what's going on. And I, I'm just, uh, we've been having so much fun with momentum, but the funnest part has just been simply just seeing these students come to Christ for the first time. Man, I'm telling you what, that's what the church is all about, amen? That's what ministry is all about, and we're seeing it, and it's just so amazing. I want to brag about Merge a little bit. You might have just heard us dismiss the mergers, and you're thinking, what's Merge? It's, uh, it's our sixth through ninth grade uh, team, Tyler White and Joe Andrews, some amazing young men. They're, uh, they're actually interning here at the church during this year of their schooling, and Man, they have been just knocking it out of the park with Merge, and it, you're probably sick of your 6th through ninth graders every other week bragging about how much fun they had in Merge, because, man, they're just having such a good time down there, and they're getting the word, man. These two young men are just learning how to do ministry, and they're doing that, you know, not by just studying books, but they're learning it by doing ministry. They're learning by just actually ministering to, the, to these young kids, and uh, it, it's really it's such a big facet of our youth ministry, and I'm just so excited that these young men are in this church and that they're in my life, and I'm just so excited what they're doing. Uh, lastly, we just started, uh, probably one of my favorite things that we're doing right now, we just started about a month ago, it's called a D-team. Uh, essentially, it's a discipleship team. It's, it's a, it's a, you could call it a teenage life group. D-team just sounds a little bit cooler, so we're calling it a D-team. Uh, but essentially, that capital D stands for disciples in this group. You're going to hear a little more about this group at the end of my message, but basically, it's just a bunch of teenagers that are saying, you know what? I don't want to just come to church. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to just call myself a Christian. Like, I want to be a disciple of Christ. I'm excited about that. I'm so stinking excited about that. So I could go on all day and brag about our teenagers, but you guys, some of you are probably already like, okay, you know, come on, is this guy going to read from the Bible or what? So I'm going to go ahead and skip past that, but I do. This morning I'm also talking on behalf of, uh, of, of the Trinity kids who you just saw, Miranda and a couple of them down here. We're going to kind of be talking on behalf of Nick and Miranda as well this morning. Pastor Nick would probably love to be standing right here. He could easily, uh, he could have easily got up this morning and brought the word. But uh, Pastor, 
I, they gave me an excuse, but I really think the real reason is Pastor Nick and Miranda have things running so smoothly down there. I mean, leadership team, I've been down there recently. They got it running so smoothly. I think Pastor Rob went to him and said, just give this to Scott. I, I can't pull you guys, I can't afford to pull you out of there. Like, you're doing too many good things. We got to keep you down there. So this morning, I'm talking on behalf of them. And man, Pastor Nick and Miranda are amazing people. They really are. They really are. I'm so... I'm so I'm so impressed already with, with just what they're doing to that ministry and his vision moving forward. And I know that many of you as parents or just churchgoers in general don't get to head down to that end and really catch what they're doing down there that often. So Pastor Nick put a little something together for you. So just enjoy this video, just a little piece of what, what they have going on down there. Nick and Miranda. We just wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on in the Trinity Kids Room. Enjoy! can't get excited about that, ask your neighbor to check your pulse. I'm excited about what's going on, especially, man, having four kids myself, I'm so excited about what's going on down there. I just uh, lost my notes. Here they come back up here. Okay. I tell you, me, me and Katie are, all right, we're so excited to have the opportunity to, 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 to dream with Pastor Nick and Miranda and just to work closely with them. We've, uh, we've really bonded with them quickly. In fact, when we took over as youth ministers, they were kind of our first uh, husband and wife couple that joined our ministry team, our leadership team in AMP. So a, a part of me when I heard he was coming on staff was just kind of like, yeah, man, I'm, so, I'm excited because our church is gaining, you know, an amazing kids pastor and we're gaining an ama uh, amazing, you know, Miranda's amazing herself. And, uh, so, but I was, it was kind of bittersweet because I was thinking that kind of stinks because we're losing, you know, some of our leaders in youth ministry. So about a month or so into, uh, into them being on staff at the church, they were still coming to our Wednesday night services and still just kind of being part of the leadership team. So finally I went to them and I said, you know, I just want to let you guys know, I know you guys got a lot going on. Like, don't feel like, you know, you, you have to stick around. You know, I mean, I, I, I was just thinking maybe they just want me to release them. Maybe they're just being somewhat obedient. And Miranda looked at me and said, we ain't going anywhere. Like, you know, you know that little attitude. She was like, what are you talking about? We ain't going anywhere. And I was like, okay. That, you're here to stay, that's good. So I went to them the next week and I said, hey, remember what you said? You know, you're gonna stay in my ministry? Well, take this, I'm gonna work in your ministry then. If you're gonna, you, if you're gonna stay in my ministry, I'm gonna work in your ministry. And, and we've done that, so I've, we've kind of talked about us joining their team down there and myself even getting in there preaching every once in a while. That way Nick and Miranda can come in here and enjoy the, the, the service with you all. And that way, you know, because it's really, I don't, I don't necessarily see it, or I, I think we should not necessarily see it as, you know, two separate ministries that eventually collide into each other. But really, one ministry, one ministry, one team, working together, you know? I mean, they're building these relationships with them, so to them to carry on in youth ministry and just keep on building those relationships through makes a lot of sense to me. 
makes a lot of sense to me. And for Katie and myself to be down there imparting things into these kids' life, getting to know these kids, that way when they get to be teenagers, they're not like, oh, this is scary. It's different. They're like, oh, man, that's Pastor Scott. We, we know him. This isn't scary at all. Let's go. Let's do this. So I'm really excited to kind of build that team relationship with them. And so far, it's just been amazing to just sit around them and just, you know, talk about what that's going to look like. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one big team. What a concept, right? One big team. What, what, what an amazing concept. I love... Uh, my message this morning is simply entitled Up and Comers. Up and Comers. I'm talking about the next generation, the next generation coming up. If, if you were ever an athlete, or maybe, I don't know if anybody in here was a professional athlete, but professional athletes, you know, they, they come out of college, they got all the speed, but eventually, I mean, I'm 37 years old, I'd be washed up in almost anything. Even, even golf nowadays, there's these young kids that are coming up and they're just stronger and they're built more. There's these up and comers that are just always coming up behind you to just push, not so much push the older ones out, but we're really supposed to be molding that next generation. I mean, there's always scout teams on a sports team that's always out looking for that next up and comer. Like, who's, who's the next big thing? What, what are they doing? So this morning, I want to simply talk about the up and comers in this generation. I loved Pastor Bill's message last week. It was good, wasn't it? Man, I love that message. He quoted Paul out of Romans chapter 12, and I love what Paul says in verse number 5. Romans chapter 12, verse 5 says, One body with many members. The church is one body with many members. Regardless of how big our church ever gets, regardless of how many programs we have going on, regardless of how many moving parts, let's never forget Paul's words. One church, one body body of believers. This includes surrounding churches, even the church down the road. We're one church. We're one body of believers. There's only one kingdom, and it belongs to who? God. Jesus. Let us never forget that. I will admit, I'll be the first one to admit, this isn't an easy concept. This is not an easy concept. Like so many of Paul's teachings, this is challenging. Amen? Anybody else agree? This is, this is a challenging teaching, especially in a day and age where culture seems to be changing at a pace that nobody can keep up with. I mean, if you have a phone in your pocket, you just bought it last month, start shopping because that's going to be out of date in no time. Culture, technology, everything is just changing so rapidly. One of the things that I love about this church is the vast representation of generations. Of all generations. Man, we got that here. I'm telling you, we have something in our church. And I'm not just talking about like a little bit of a sprinkle here, that generation, little sprinkle here, and then this generation is big. Man, when I look across the board, I see tons of little kids hungry for Jesus. I see tons of teenagers hungry for Jesus. I see more young families in this church than I've ever seen in church. I see the, the, the baby boomers are booming. I see the, the elders, the older generation. I don't want to call you old, but I don't, I don't know what else, what else to do, but there's, there's, not just like, there's not just little sprinkles here and there. There's a vast representation of multiple generations in our church, and I think, I think it's awesome. I think it's amazing. Many people would look at this and say, man, that's a challenge. Can I tell you this morning? I don't see it as a challenge. I see it as an amazing opportunity. I see that as an opportunity, a God-given opportunity. I see an opportunity for multiple generations to come together and unite. Multiple generations to come together and unite and begin to make disciples of the next generation below them. And I mean, it's, it's really simple. This generation up here disciples the generation below them. That generation disciples the generation below them, and that generation, you get the picture, so on and so forth. We have an opportunity to do, to do that in this church, and it's so important that we succeed. Hear me. It's so important that we succeed in making disciples in this church. After, it's literally what God called us to do. It's literally what God called us as Christians to do. Matthew 28, 19 said what? Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. We call it the Great Commission. In reality, it's really the only commission. Like God, God gave us lots of commands. You know, he gave, us, he gave us the law. He gave us lots of commands. But there's really one thing that God said, this is what you're going to do. This is what, if you're going to be a disciple, this is what you're going to do. And I'm commissioning you. It's the only commission. Go and make disciples. Be a disciple first, then recreate yourself. Always be making disciples out of the next generation. We have an opportunity to do that here. I think when we typically look at that verse, go and make disciples of all nations, I think typ typically we're drawn to look at it from a missionary perspective, right? 
I think it's natural to kind of do that. After all, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. So I think it's typically normal to look at that just from a, a, a missionary perspective or possibly even from an outreach perspective. Go, you know, leave, leave the church and go out into your community. Go to nations. Go to, into your community and in your neighborhoods. I think we always look at it that way, and I think it's, it's good to look at it that way. I mean, that's certainly what it means, but I'm going to go ahead and allow the missionary to preach it from that angle, and I'll allow our amazing outreach pastor to preach it from that angle, but I believe that there's another aspect of that verse as well, because Trinity Assembly of God and the people in it is also all nations. Amen? So we can't always just look at, you know, go, go here, go there. I, I think we have to look at it from a different perspective. Sometimes the go... And that verse means go get on a plane and go to another nation and go tell them about me. Go teach them about me. Sometimes I think the go in that verse means go to your neighbor and teach them about me. Go into your community and go make contacts. That way you can build a, you know, a community of, uh, of believers. Go. Sometimes I believe that that verse, the go in that verse means go to your church. Go teach a Sunday school class and teach them about me. Go teach a life group and teach them about me. Go to your church and find someone that needs to be mem mentored and go teach them about me. I don't think that go means uh, always go far away. Sometimes it just means go right where you're at and just do it and just do it. I truly believe that a church that catches this, I truly believe that a church where generations come and worship together in unison a church where generations pray together and encourage each other is a church where the Holy Spirit lives and dwells and disciples are being produced by the masses. I believe that. I mean, I'm talking by the masses. I'm talking Acts chapter 2 type stuff here. Acts chapter 2. 3,000 in a day? Why not? Why not? If we do what God said, if we just simply heed to those words, go and make disciples, man, I think, I think God's going to just begin to blow our minds. When, a, when generations unite and come together for one purpose, watch out. I'm telling you, watch out. I've had the pleasure uh, a few times lately to sneak down on a Thursday afternoon, thurs or Thursday mornings rather. Wednesday nights are, are real busy for me. I'm usually here really late. So typically on Thursday mornings I come in, it's just like, you know, kind of hard to get into the motions and what do I do? So lately, uh, uh, Pastor Bill has in invited me down to lead worship with the 50 plusers, and I've just kind of taken it on myself, even on the off days, to just go down there and connect with them. And I've just been spending some time down there, hopefully spending some more time down there, because I love it, those Thursday mornings, just to connect with that generation. And I feel like I've made some new friends down there. I feel like I've made some new friends in that group, and I feel like I've reconnected. Yeah, go ahead, clap. That's, that's good. I mean, it's generations connected. I'm telling you, there's something to this. There's something to this. And uh, I feel like I've made some new friends down there. I feel like I've, I, I, I've, I've reconnected with, uh, with, with, with some old friends. And I don't think that it's any shock to my new friends down there and my old friends down there when I look at you and say that this generation is different than yours. Can I, can I get some, some head nods out there? This generation is just a little bit different than yours. It's very different than yours. They talk different. They dress different. They learn different. They communicate different. They worship different. They're just different. And some of you from, from generations before might look at them and say, man, things made so much more sense when we were your age. It made so much more sense. You might say, you know what? When we were your age, we knew how to communicate. Man, your generation needs, needs to figure out how to communicate. And if I'm being honest, like, I'm with you on some of those things. I'm no spring chicken myself. I'm not. I'm 37, I'm 37 years old. I'm almost 38. I'm pushing 40. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> I am. I am. I don't feel it, though. Like, I feel as young as ever. So, I mean, I, I used to, um, in fact, I was thinking this week. It was 20 plus years ago. Like, the average age of our youth group is, I don't know, 15, 16, maybe. It was about 23 years ago when I sat right there where they're sitting, the same section. Many of you back then, I was just kind of thinking about this, were my age when I was their age. Think about this. I mean, I'm almost 40, so if you're in that 60 range, when I was right there, you were my age. You feel really old right now, don't you? <laughs> Think about it, though. Think about it. It's true. And I remember, I mean, literally, I mean, I sat, I sat right there. I, I remember being on Carpenter Road 
and, uh, and, and showing up to a, a worship service in the old fellowship hall upstairs, I think is what we called it. Some of you might remember this, and, we, and Pastor Jeff Chris, who was our youth pastor at, at the time, piled us all in, in the church vans, and, and we drove over here to do what we, what we did on several occasions that I remember anyways, where we would just come over, even before there was a building here, we would come over and just pray over the property and just as teenagers, and it was so cool. And I remember one time he brought us into this, into this sanctuary for the first time, I think, and the, the floors were concrete. I mean, it was very unfinished at the time. There was there was no carpet, there was no pews, there was still a ton of work that had to be done, but we just kind of walked around the sanctuary and prayed, and I remember uh, towards the end of that time, he, he got us all together and he said, pick where you're going to sit. Pick out your section. So I remember us as a youth group, I, I don't remember, maybe, maybe we prayed about it, maybe we just, you know, took an angle and looked, but like, I remember the time when we all got together and said, this is where the Trinity youth are going to sit, and it's so amazing that you guys are still sitting right there. It's just, it, it just kind of blows my mind, but I'm telling you, man, we, bl- like 25 plus years ago, we blanketed that area that you're sitting with prayer, and it's just, it still blows my mind that he has allowed me now to come back and, 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 and to kind of have this different role, but I say that to simply say this. I've completely lost my place, but I think I was saying that <laughs> to simply say this. Things are different. Things are different. I mean, just imagine, you know, like that 25 years ago when, when you were my age. Think about how different things are now. Things are very different. The internet was a brand new concept. I remember when the internet came out. It was a brand new concept. Some thought it would never last. It did. Still hanging around. That pesky internet just can't get rid of it. It's still hanging around. Cell phones were for the wealthy, and they were about the size of my head. Remember those? The Zach Morris phone? Mary Walker, the Zach Morris one. I remember uh, after I just graduated college, I went to work for, for Wendell Matson for a little while, um, and I have recovered fully from that per- time period in my life. Uh, I'm just kidding. He's in Montana, so I can ha- harass him a little bit. But no, I remember we were, it was me and him in his big old truck. He had a single cab truck, and it was me, him, and then in the middle was this humongous car phone that he had. And I just remember thinking, man, this guy must be rich. He's got a car phone. And it was like this mon- like monstrous thing that had to plug into the little lighter jack, you know, and had this like spiral record just like your home phone did it was it was crazy but i mean this is everything has changed so much look where we are now so what's my point there's no going back we're 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 not gonna i mean even though those might have been simpler times culture's not gonna allow us to go back i wish it would sometimes but there's no going back the internet's here to stay social media isn't going anywhere ipads and smartphones are only going to continue to get smarter. And I believe this is okay. I do. I truly believe that this is okay. I believe that there's still hope for our world. I believe that there's still hope for this generation. In fact, I believe that there's still hope for this generation to be the, the, the greatest generation of world changers that this world has ever seen. I believe that. I believe it with my whole heart. How, you ask? By you and I stepping into their game. By you and I getting into their game. This is what their playing field looks like. Just a, just a dose of their playing field. The third leading cause of death in America amongst the ages of 15 to 24 is suicide. There's 5,400 teen uh, suicide attempts every year. 4,600 of those are successful. That's crazy. Blows my mind. Jesus Christ is not welcome in their schools, but every other false god is perfectly accepted. This is their game. This is their playing field. God's Not Dead, many of you have seen the movie. It was a good movie, great script. I gotta admit, I watched it and thought, man, that, it's a great movie, but that could never happen. That movie is being played out, not in colleges, not just in colleges, but our high schools. Our high schools. I, I, I have three students that over the course of the last six months have either called me or came to me and said, man, I need some counseling. I had this teacher, it's not a religion class, it's not anything, but just in the, in the middle of class, basically, just for no reason at all, said, you know what, I, I used to be a Christian, but I, now that stuff's ridiculous. I mean, it's a high school class, it's not about religion, and yet they're like getting on their soapbox just simply to tear apart religion, to tear apart, uh, about, tear apart God. It's happening in our classrooms. You know what the good news is? Those students that talked to me, they stood up. Yeah, it's huge. They didn't just, they didn't just slouch down in their seat and say, man, I, I can't wait till this is over. They, they either interrupted the class or they went to the teacher after class and said, you know what, I just got to let you know, I'm a Christian. I don't believe, I don't believe what, you're, what you're feeding me here. I'm not going to chew on it. 
I'm going to spit it out. That's what they're saying. I, I remember uh, in, in the last month is, is when one of these situations came up the last month or so. It was like the first week of school. The first week of school, it's like, hey, here's your itinerator for the year. By the way, I don't believe in God, and you shouldn't either. That, that's, that's literally what it, it was the first week of school. And I remember what, I was praying one night, and I was like, God, man, what do we do to stop this? Like, I mean, I mean, I mean can, I, can I go to the school? I mean, I, I wasn't, wasn't going to go to the school, but I'm thinking, what can I do? Like, what can we do to stop this? And you know what God said to me? He said, you know what? They're talking about me in a classroom. They're, 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 they're talking about me, and I'm like, okay, okay. And your students are sticking up for me. God's being talked about in classrooms. I mean, God's using what, what somebody is tr attempting to, to destroy the kingdom of God, and, and God's doing what he does so good. He's using it for the good. And I love that about God. He's using it. Moms and dads in the same home is highly abnormal, while same-sex marriage is shockingly normal. Standing up for your faith and standing firm on the word of God will almost certainly label you a hater and a bigot. I could go on. I, I could preach for another hour just on, on, on the things that, that they go through the, nowadays. It's so different. Even 20 years ago when I sat where they sat, it's so different. The world is so different. This is what their playing field looks like, and I believe that we must get in their game instead of trying to drag them into ours. Instead of trying to drag them into ours. The first step in reaching this generation isn't to drag them out of their culture in order to teach them, but rather to step into their culture in order to hear them and learn from them first. I debated on whether leaving that statement in there because that's kind of a crazy statement, but the more, I, the more I read it, I was just like, it's, it's true, God. It's so true. In order to teach a younger generation, we must first be willing to learn from them. I'm sure you've heard this before. I love the way the late philosopher Alan Watts put it. He said this in a statement. He said, wisdom often doesn't come from the top down, but rather from the bottom up. He was in his old age when he said this, and it, apparently a very wise man from what I read about him. He said, we, the older generation, have a function, but in order to fulfill that function, we must first realize that we can learn from the young. Once we understand that and catch that, then we can be wise ourselves and become teachers. That's quite a statement. That's quite a statement. I fell in love with that statement this week. I don't know if Alan was a Christian. Uh, I have no idea, but he went on to compare this statement to that of Jesus' conversation with the disciples in Matthew chapter 18. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you have your phones or iPads, something fancy like that, go ahead and swipe to it. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to just go ahead and just dive into what, what's taking place, starting with verse 1 here. Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 1 says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the greatest? I can, I can kind of let my mind wander and kind of imagine what this scene might have looked like. We got, we got the disciples huddled up over here, and they're kind of talking, and they're like, You know what? Clearly, we're the it team. Clearly, we're the varsity team. I mean, Jesus handpicked us. We're the stars of the game. We're the starting 12. It's us. But who do you think among us is the greatest? One of us clearly in this, in this inner circle right here is the greatest. And I imagine, you know, different ones probably, you know, stepped to the plate. Matthew probably said, well, if you think about it, man, I was a tax collector. I mean, I gave up a lot to follow God. I mean, I, I've came a long ways. Certainly, I'm at least most improved player. Possibly, it, it at least puts me in the running for MVP, Right? Judas probably spoke up and said, you know what, man, I'm, I'm in charge of the money. They don't, they don't give that to just anybody. I mean, I'm the one over here counting. I mean, I'm trusted, clearly. Peter probably would have spoke up from the back and said, anybody else in here ever walk on water? Remember that time that I got out of that boat and I stepped in, in the water and Andrew probably slapped him in the back of his head and said, yeah, dummy, remember 10 seconds later when you started to sink? Jesus had to, to get down there and rescue you. But you can imagine these disciples are talking and, and, and they're thinking, man, Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? It's certainly one of us, so let's go ask Jesus. So they, they go over to Jesus and they simply say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In verse 2, it says, he called a little child over to him. Jesus calls a little child over to him and placed the child among them. Verse 3, and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's crazy. 
He went on in verse 6 to even emphasize this a little more. He said, in fact, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Not only do you got to become like them, if you ever think about harming one of them, you're going to be swimming with the fishes. Essentially, that's what he's telling them. That's strong. Could you imagine the reaction? I'm picturing big eyes like, man, I really wish we could take that question back. That was probably not the smartest question to ask him. I kind of picture John, the disciple whom Jesus loved in the background, you know, saying like, I told you guys. I told you guys not to ask him that. Yeah, I just picture him being the cool one in the back like, I, I told you. I told you that was a dumb move. Jesus said to his disciples, those who had left all behind to follow him, they left everything to follow him. He said to the few that he had taken under his wing to mold and train and to eventually lay the foundation of what we now know as the church, that for them to even stand a chance at seeing the kingdom of God, they must change and become like a child. I can't help but be a little stunned by this statement as well, if I'm being honest. What was Jesus saying? What does he mean? These were good men who he obviously trusted. They really were kind of his inner circle. What sort of message is this? I believe Jesus was simply saying this. Keep it simple. Stop trying to overcomplicate things. Stop worrying about all these stupid things that you're worrying about that don't mean a thing. Keep it simple. Wow, is that really the time? Okay, here we go. My daughter Kylie this week asked me, how to spell one of her friend's names. She, she was writing something out for one of her, one of her friend's names, and I, I proceeded to give her about 10 spellings that I thought might be the proper spelling of this word. And, and once I was finally certain that I had covered them all, I had the thought, I could still be way off. It could be some crazy spelling that makes no sense. Because that's how we, we like to do it. We, we complicate everything nowadays. Complicate everything. My name's Scott. It's S-C-O-T-T. -T. I, don't, I don't feel the need to throw a little Z in front of it and say, well, actually, there's a, a silent Z in there. It makes no sense makes no sense, but for some reason, it seems like we, we this, this culture likes to overcomplicate things. We add steps. We often emphasize all the wrong things, and it complicates things and brings confusion. And I believe Jesus is trying to steer his disciples and us as well from all of that. So he calls to a child, maybe a girl playing with a doll that someone had made for her, maybe a boy that was over kicking a ball around with his friends, and he brings them over there, and he says this is what's gonna get you into the kingdom of heaven. This is what you need to become. Keep it simple, like this child. God made, gave me a, a crystal clear glimpse of this earlier this week. As I was helping that same daughter, Kylie, she was working on a homework assignment. She came to me earlier this week and she brought this homework assignment and she was all excited, said, Daddy, I have some homework. We, we gotta do some homework together. And my first thought was, I hate homework. I hate it. I hated my homework when I was in school. I, I hate their homework. I hate helping them with their homework. But she was, she was all excited. I'd rather do dishes. I'd rather do almost anything than, than, than help my kids with their homework. It's hard. It, she's in first grade. It's not always that easy. It's kind of hard. It's different nowadays. I promise you. Don't laugh. You ain't been there in a long time. Help your grandkids if, if you're laughing at me. I'm telling you, it's hard. So she brings this to me, and it's, it's this sheet of paper that has all these different shapes all over this paper and it's filled and there's 50 shapes total. And the assignment simply calls for to fill every single shape, every, everything on here, every space, all 50 of them with something that you love. Something that you love. And it could be hobbies, it could be people, it could be foods, it could be animals, it could be vacations that you take on, places that you visit. I mean, there was, it listed like, like, like 10 different things that you could possibly use to, to symbolize things that you love and to, to be put on this piece of paper. I'm thinking, this is easy. This, I'm a little bit frustrated because, I mean, Katie happens to be working late this night, so I not only have now this homework assignment that I didn't sign up for, I also have three other kids, three other kids that are going to need my attention, but in this rare moment of grace sent down from above, like, the whole house is peaceful during this time. I, I go and check on, on my oldest daughter, Maya, and she's in her room, and she's helping Kylie learn how to count or something like that, and I walk back through the living room, and Landon's sitting on the couch watching a, a movie, and he's got a whole box of cheese that's on his lap, just... <laughs> They're all over the couch, and I'm thinking, Katie would kill me, but I don't care. It's quiet. I'm going to go ahead and run for it. And I just, I kind of just had this sense that, that God had kind of prepared this moment for me to spend some time with Kylie. Me to just, just a little extra time with Kylie. If, if there was something in my spirit that just said, sit down. I know you this, but sit down. And of course, I'm thinking, okay, she must need me. Like, God must have prepared this. She must need me. 
So we start this assignment, and she, of course, st- starts out with the obvious, you know, well, I love my mom, I love my dad, and I love my sister. She names everybody in her house, and then she, and then she automatically gets stumped a little bit. So I go where every dad is going to go, and I'm going to say, well, who loves you more than anybody in this world? And she says, God. And I say, well, maybe, maybe God should be on this list too. And, and she surprises me a little bit. She says, no, Jesus. So, so I said, okay, okay, I will accept that. And I just began to, to lay just a simple foundation of the systematic theology of the Trinity and how Jesus actually, no, I'm just kidding. I didn't do any of that. I didn't do any of that. But I explained to her that Jesus was a perfectly fine example in there. So she puts Jesus on there and she had began to kind of seemingly get rolling a little bit on this, you know. She seemed like she was doing okay, so... So, uh, so I just, I, I just, I just kind of excuse myself from the table, and uh, I'm, I'm busy slaving over dinner. I got the frozen lasagna taken out and put onto a cookie sheet, and I got the film ripped off, and then I read the directions and realize the film had to be back on there. So I'm busy. You had no idea I was so domesticated, but man, I do it all. I do it all. So, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of doing some, doing some other things, and uh, she eventually gets stuck, and she says, "Daddy, I'm having a hard time spelling something. Will you come over here?" And uh, she's. Uh, as they, as, as they look at the paper, I just, I'm immediately drawn to something. See, if, if you don't know my daughter, Kylie, she's, she's a, little bit, a little bit different. Now, I mean, not, not in a bad way, but she's very particular. Like, she gets frustrated really easy, and she shuts down really easy, so, it, which, is, which is part of the reason I was so excited to just have this quiet time with her. And she, she's very particular about the way she does things. She loves patterns. I mean, this was the kid that would open up a, a, a pack of Skittles, literally, and not eat a single one until she separated all the colors. She does it with her Fruit Loops in the morning, like she just, she separates it all. She's very particular, so I, I glance onto this page, and I wasn't surprised to see that she had started in the upper left-hand corner, and just kind of started to work down the page and then get down to the page and work around as if to kind of create a border. Can you see what I'm saying? She's going to kind of go around. But as I glanced at the border, I noticed that she had broken this pattern and there was a little oval right in the middle of the page, clearly in the middle, and she had written Jesus in that little oval. And, and I immediately kind of stopped, stopped in my tracks and I was like, wow, look at that. And God spoke to me in that moment and said, you know what? She gets it. Your six-year-old daughter she gets it. How often do we get so busy and overwhelmed with things and different patterns of life and the routines that we neglect to realize that God has slipped out of the center of our lives and into the background somewhere? The Pharisees and Sadducees were pros at this. They did it all the time. In Mark chapter 12, we see this exact same thing happen. And one of the teachers of the law, in verse 28, I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit for, for time's sake. Verse 28 says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus hadn't given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? I like how the, the, the gospel writer Luke records this. He, he records the, the question as being, what must I do to, to, see the, to see the kingdom of God? What must I do to make it into heaven? He's clearly noticing that this Jesus guy is pretty sharp. Maybe he's, he's thinking, man, they've been going at it. He's been kind of debating for a little while. He's winning, but he's got to be rattled by this time. I think I got him. I think, I think I might be giving him the uppercut. Jesus plainly and simply quotes the written law out of the book of Deuteronomy. In verse 30, we says, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus says, man, that's, that question's simple. It was answered long ago by my father, and the answer remains the same still today. Love God. Number one, el numero uno, love God. Jesus says that one's simple. Above everything that we are, above everything that we do, we must keep God at the very top of our priority list. We must love God first. My six-year-old daughter gets this. Even despite her needs for patterns and for everything to be a certain way, the knowledge of Jesus at the center of everything is enough to break her out of this mold. I believe that God created her like she is, very particularly, but I believe that he also created her even, even the way she is with the capacity to know that everything stops and, and, and brings Jesus into the center of everything. I truly believe that. As I'm processing this, she's motoring through her homework. I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm straightening up. I've already slaved and created this magnificent dinner, and now I'm thinking, okay, we got to begin to prepare the table. we got to get this assignment moving. I'm literally looking around the house at this, to- this time for, like, favorite toys, favorite foods, anything. I'm pointing out fun things that we did together, some vacations that we have taken recently. She's basically ignoring me. 
She's thinking and contemplating carefully what she loves most in this world. Not, not, not anything's going to make it onto this list. I mean, she, she's taking this serious. I'm thinking, how hard is it? I could finish this thing in 60 seconds. I love a lot of things. I start thinking, I love hunting, fishing, golfing, camping, swimming, roller coasters, my guitar, my ministry, pizza, beef jerky, ice cream, cookies, brownies, <laughs> sweet and sour chicken, every other kind of chicken, cinnamon toast crunch, the cereal. I love a lot of things, and I'm thinking, what could be taking her so long? This is easy. So in an attempt to rush things back along, I sit down to offer up my vast wisdom one last time. And as I look at the paper again, I'm taken back. Very few things that I had blurted out ever made it on to Kylie's list that day. In fact, very few things in general made it onto this list. The top 50 loves in my six-year-old's life were not toys, they weren't hobbies, they weren't places of things. They were people. They were people. In fact, other than the things that I was feeding her to rush her along, it was almost all people. Not things. Names. Some were family members. Nina, I think you're here somewhere. You made it on the list. You can celebrate. My mother-in-law. Some friends for school. Mostly were names of faces that I can see in this room this morning. My daughter loves people. She loves her church. Man, I'm telling you, this brought so much joy to me. God was like hammering me in this moment. Many of your kids were on the list. Your dog even made it on the list. <laughs> many of your kids, many faces in here, many teenagers. You were, you were on the list. Many teenagers that on a Wednesday night, instead of hanging out with your friends, you're out playing with my kids, investing in them. You made it on the list. Kayla, you made it on the list. Pastor Tyler, you did not make the list, but oddly enough, <laughs> oddly enough, your beard did. It did. I kid you not. In one of the boxes, it said Pastor Tyler's beard. <laughs> I'll have to show you the paper. Your beard made it. In fact, it's getting late. Uh, now that I brought you up, would, would, would the worship team join me up here? I'm going I'm to bring this boat to a close pretty soon. As I studied this collage, feeling quite guilty about the collage that I was forming in my head, about these amazing things that were important to me, these amazing things that I love. God spoke to me again and said, I told you, she gets it. People, it's people. I wanna to return to, to Mark chapter 12 for just a moment. I, 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 I already quoted verse 30 that says, love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, your mind, and with, all your, with all your strength. But, but Jesus didn't stop there. This answer probably satisfied that teacher of the law, but Jesus went on one step further. And in verse 31 it says, you know what? The second most important thing is very similar, and it's simply this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love people. Jesus isn't just referring to your neighbor, those who live close to you. In fact, the Greek word for neighbor here is, I, I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly, plesion or plesion, which simply means near. He's not just saying love the person that lives next door to you or love the person that lives on your cul-de-sac or love the person that lives close to you. He's saying love anybody you, you ever come near, everybody you come in contact with. Love every person, the person that you pass in the grocery store, even if it's just a smile and a, hey, how are you? You know, instead of just motor and pass them with a grumpy look on your face. Love them. The person that you might stop and hand $20 for $20 in gas on the way home. Take two seconds and just love them somehow. The people in this church, look around you. Love each other. God's saying love everybody. Loving God's pretty easy. Loving people, not always so easy. It's a little more challenging there. Maybe it's just me. I sat there studying this list as she finished it up. And I allowed God to just begin to deal with the conviction that I was feeling from this sermon that my six-year-old just preached to me through this homework assignment. And I was so proud of her. And then she handed it to me and I went to place it in the folder to put it in her backpack to get it all ready for school the next day. I was drawn back to the space on the page where she had written the name Jesus, and I noticed something that I hadn't noticed before. See, now that it was all filled in, I began to see some detail on the page that I'd never seen. Like some of these shapes were just quite generic. Some of them were just circles, squares, and triangles. But then I began to notice some of them were, were, were picture frames. 
Some of them were almost like ornaments that, that, that would be hanging somewhere, maybe on a Christmas tree, or they were, they, were, they were decorations. But as I was drawn back to that oval where she had put the name Jesus, I noticed for the first time that it was a mirror. There was an oval mirror on, this, on, on, on the center of this page, and that's where she wrote the name of Jesus. And I heard God speak to me one more time, and he simply said this, reflect Jesus. Reflect Jesus my son and before God could say it again I beat him to the punch and I said I know she gets it I know God you don't have to tell me you've been beating me up for the last hour where all, where all this amazing lasagna has been cooking I get it she gets it she gets things that I don't get I get it God love God love people reflect the son would you stand with me this morning I want to, if I can this morning, return things back to the younger generation here. I believe that God has amazing things for this young generation. I believe that God is, is, is saying loud and clear to our church, get in their game. Stop dra trying to drag them into your game. Get in their game. And I'm constantly asking God, like, God, show me, show me how to do this. Like, you, you've called me here and, and, and I gotta believe you've equipped me for it but show me how to do things because I, I don't want to give them anything other than Jesus I don't want to give these students that you're seeing walking down here right now anything other than Jesus I, I came across this, across this quote this week and I loved it it's from missionary William Carey and it says I'm not afraid of failure I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter I'm not afraid to fail, but I'm afraid of succeeding with things that don't matter. I don't want to flood them with stuff that don't matter. I want to flood them with Jesus, the things that do matter. I don't want to flood them with, you know, 20 programs every year that might be fun. I mean, that stuff's important, but if I'm not giving them Jesus, if I'm not give, giving them an opportunity to have life transformation, then what am I doing? What am I doing as a youth pastor? I have this portfolio here. I'm so thankful that, that, that Pastor Rob keeps things simple. I've had port job portfolios in the past that was like this thick and I'd have to read through it and say like, where's my role in here? Pastor Rob has, there's one piece of paper and it simply says my role's on it, it's so simple. And it, but those are, those are my roles as an employee at, as, at this church. And I take those very seriously. But God has a portfolio for my life too and it's, it's also one piece of paper, but it's, it, it's one sentence, it's one statement. Go and make disciples it that's my portfolio as a follower of Christ as a disciple of Christ myself go make disciples these students that you're seeing down here right now are students that have uh, uh, that have joined this D team that I told you about earlier and it's just simply a team of students that are just saying you know what I want to go deeper essentially we're taking Jesus's statement when he says anyone that wants to be a disciple of mine anyone that wants to follow me must first deny himself pick up their cross and follow me these students are doing it and I'm telling you their lives are being changed I'm so excited to see where God continues to move in this D team and, and how he continues to grow these students God's moving in this church amen God's moving in this church he wants to move in your lives this morning God wants to move in your lives this morning I don't know where you're at this morning I don't know where you were when you walked in the door maybe you got ministered to down here during the amazing time of ministry this morning I don't know where you are. I don't know if you even know Jesus right now, but I want to give you an opportunity right now to change that if you don't know Christ. And I'm not going to do it the normal way. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. Because let's face it, everybody peeks anyways, right? Everybody peeks. I'm going to ask you to do this. If that's you this morning, if you don't know Christ, and if anything here has made sense, whether it came from my lips or maybe God spoke it directly to your heart, and you say, you know what? I want to accept Christ. I want to pick up my cross and follow him. I'm just going to invite you right now to, to be brave and to step out of your seat and just come down here and enjoy and join these students that have made that call. If there's anyone in here this morning, anyone in here that says, you know what? I don't know Christ. Today's the day where I change that. This is your opportunity. I just invite you to come down here and meet us down in front.